I can't get the uh, image. Oh. Good evening and welcome to Pyramid Art Books and Custom Framings Book Talk with author Marita Golden and Janice Kearney discussing Marita's latest book, The Strong Black Woman. And behind me, you see we are celebrating the third day of Kwanzaa Ujima, collective work and responsibility. And Marita Golden exemplifies this principle in her writings, in her life. And so we are so happy that she has joined us this evening. And Janice Kearney is an author, lecturer, and owner of Writing Our World Publishing Company and mentor to our guest, Read, Write, Share. So we are excited to have both women here tonight sharing their thoughts about the strong Black woman. And I am so excited to hand this over to Janice to introduce our guest tonight. Janice. Thank you. Thank you, Garbo. Good evening. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Good, good. Thanks, Garbo, for having us, for allowing us to be co-hosts for this conversation that everybody has been talking about all over the country. And we are so lucky that we were able to talk Marita Golden into uh, having a book conversation with us in Arkansas. And Garbo, thank you for everything you do for the community and for the state of Arkansas and even beyond for the literary community. We are so grateful to you. My role tonight is to introduce my friend and my mentor of over 20 years, uh, Marita Golden, someone I have admired so much because she's done so many things that I have dreamed of doing and she continues to do them. Um, so I am really ecstatic to be able to introduce her tonight. Marita is the author of 19 works of fiction and nonfiction. Her books include her novels, The Wide Circumference of Love, After, and The Edge of Heaven. Her memoirs are Migrations of the Heart, Saving Our Sons, and Don't Play in the Sun, One Woman's Journey Through the Color Complex. And her anthology, which she edited, is Us Against Alzheimer's, Stories of fi Family Love and Faith. Her most recent work in nonfiction is the Strong Black Woman, How a Myth Endangers the Physical and Mental Health of Black Women. Marita is the recipient of many awards, including the Writer for Writers Award presented by Barnes and Noble and Poets and Writers, an award from the Authors Guild and the Fiction Award for her novel, After, awarded by the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. She has lectured and read from her work internationally. She is also co-founder and president emerita of the Zora, Zora Neale Hurston Richard Wright Foundation, which is how I met her years ago. Marita Golden is a veteran teacher of writing. She taught at the University of Lagos in Nigeria and has served as a member of the faculties of the MFA graduate creative writing programs at Georgia Mason University and Virginia Commonwealth University. She has served as distinguished writer in residence for the MA Creative Writing Program at John Hopkins University and Prince George's Community College and the University of the District of Columbia. As a literary consultant, she offers writing workshops, coaching, and manuscript evaluation services. And this is, believe me, only part of what she's do done. So I am so happy to uh, bring Marita Golden to you, and I hope that you will enjoy her as much as I will. One of the things we would like for you all to do is think about your questions that you want to ask Marita at the end. But one specific question we'd like to ask is, is there a strong Black woman in your life, someone that you remember that has impacted your life over the years? And what are some of the lessons? What are some of the, the values and guides that she gave to you and you have carried with you? 
And maybe if there are some things that she shared with you that you didn't carry with you, think about that as Marita is talking tonight and share those with us if you feel up to it uh, during the question and answer session. So I am going to stop talking right now and I am going to allow Marita to share with you about her book and do some reading from the book. Thank you and welcome, Marita. Thank you, Janice. I wanna thank you, Garbo, also uh, for hosting me tonight. When I was in Arkansas uh, a couple of months ago during a residency at um, University of Central Arkansas, that's when I met Garbo and her and discovered her beautiful store, which is art gallery, bookstore. It's just, just beautiful. And that's when she invited me to do this program. And Janice and I, as Janice said, we've been friends for over 20 years and I've admired her so much. Um, her, her storytelling abilities, her writing, and just her commitment to community. So I really am among friends tonight. This is a book and a topic that I think this is a perfect time to address because we're at the end of the year. We're kind of thinking about, you know, our, our health, our, our, our mindset, what are we gonna do in the new year? And I know for many of us, we are thinking about our health and uh, how we want to modify some habits as we go into 2022. This is a book that like most of my books, I had not planned to write. Uh, what happened is I had kind of a little health scare, which led me to my doctor, which led me to have an MRI. And the MRI revealed that sometime in the past, I had had two silent strokes. Uh, the, they couldn't tell when I'd had the strokes, but I'd had these two strokes. And a silent stroke is just what it sounds like. It's silent, uh, you have no knowledge of it, but it is an actual stroke and it does do damage. Uh, and I was really upset by that because I had watched my mother die when I was 21. My father died when I was 23. I had inherited from them a genetic predisposition for heart attack and stroke. And I had lived most of my adult life doing everything I could to be very, very healthy. Watching my weight, exercising, uh, dieting, um, meditating, going into the therapist, the, the, the mental health therapist when I needed, and going for regular checkups. And initially I thought that, oh my gosh, you know, I've done everything right, my body's punishing me. But in actuality, what I learned is that the fact that I'd been so militantly determined to outlive my parents and to have a healthy life had ensured that those two strokes would be minor silent strokes rather than very serious strokes, the kind that my mother had on two occasions, one of which was fatal. And that got me thinking about my health. It got me thinking about Black women's health. And we were in the middle of a lockdown and everything was very intense, very sort of, I was feeling everything very strongly. And I got to thinking about the issue of Black women's health. And when I did some research on the internet, I found that there was a very vibrant, powerful, dynamic discussion about the strong Black woman, the strong Black woman complex, the strong Black woman ideology and how it impacts the lives of Black women. And the thing that inspired me and buoyed me a lot was that this is a conversation that was taking place across generations. If you went on Twitter, if you went on Facebook, you saw younger Black women, middle-aged Black women, older Black women, all saying that it's time to re-examine uh, the strong Black woman complex and to redefine what we mean as Black women by strength. And we know that the idea of the strong black woman is deeply, deeply rooted in our culture. It's deeply rooted in our history. Uh, the fact that we were enslaved, the fact that for generations we had so much violence uh, that our community suffered through meant that we as a marginalized, oppressed people developed a psychology of strength that in many ways for many generations served us very well. That is no matter what you throw at us, we're resilient, we can come back fighting, we'll come back stronger. And as women, because so often in our community, the men were targeted, the men were not able to support families um, as they would like, as they should have, 
we found ourselves disproportionately in leadership positions in the family, in leadership positions in the community. And so we developed the ideology that we were very, very strong. We now live in a different world. We live in a world where we can talk about the physical impact of a toxic belief system. And we now know that the strong black woman ideology, that is that you are strong, you have to be strong all the time, you have to sublimate your emotions, is a toxic, very dangerous belief. It's dangerous for a lot of reasons. One, it puts black women on a kind of emotional lockdown. It centers our ability to do things like ask for help, to set boundaries, to express uncertainty, doubt. It silences us. It means that we feel that we can't be honest about our real needs with family and with others. Right now, African-American women are in the midst of a major, major health crisis, a health emergency, if you will. Uh, four out of five African-American women are obese or overweight. Black women die of obesity-related illnesses like stroke, heart attack, cardiac arrest, more than it, proportionately more than anyone else in America. And we know the reasons for that. We know that we have a long history of lack of access, discrimination, segregation. But certainly one of the contributing factors to our ill health is that we simply don't believe we should take care of ourselves. We are deeply connected to an ideology that encourages us to sacrifice, sacrifice ourselves for community, sacrifice our health, even sacrifice our sanity for our families and for our community. Um, I know after the election of, of Joe Biden, there was a, 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 an editorial, an op-ed piece in the Washington Post where a black woman writer was saying, everyone's praising black women for saving democracy and, and asking us to do other things. Somebody needs to give us an opportunity to sit down for a change. Then what you have also connecting to the strong black woman complex is systemic racism. We know now that systemic racism, as we experience it, micro, macro, big, small, is a stress factor in our bodies. We now know, scientists, doctors now know, without a doubt, that racism is a stress factor in our bodies. And it makes it harder for us to get healthy, to stay healthy. And when you combine the impact of the stressors of systemic racism, with a, a belief that says, we don't need to ask for help. We need to sacrifice ourselves for everybody else. That's a toxic mix that definitely impacts the health metrics of black women. So we're at a point now where fortunately we're re-examining all this. And I'm very proud to be part of the growing army of public health activists, doctors, writers, scholars, uh, therapists, all who are writing about the fact that we need in our community to redefine what we mean by strength. Um, as I said, in my life, because my parents died when I was so young, I really got very connected to the idea of health very early on. And that has really had a powerful impact in my life. But like everybody else, I've had my journeys. And in the book, you will hear many voices. There's my voice. Um, there's the voice of experts and um, health activists. There's the voices of ordinary Black women who are asked to tell me stories about their journeys from trauma to healing. And um, I'm going to share a couple of small sections from the book so that you'll get a sense of the range of the book and some of the topics I, I write about. Um, so first, I want to read a little section about uh, my life and my years as a strong black woman when I was kind of young. Our bodies and souls and spirits are a map, a testimony to the ravages of enslavement, the cruel legacy of legal segregation and lack of access to wealth, good employment, stable housing, and good health care. And our psyches have been twisted and turned inside out by the stories we tell ourselves and the stories that are told about us, stories that have sometimes saved us and that have sometimes sabotaged us. The strong woman, the angry black woman, the black woman who says yes 
to everyone but herself. I was 21 years old and my mother was dying. She lay comatose in a bed in a rehabilitation center for six months, wasting away before my eyes. I was a raised the black power fist, Afro wearing militant activist and a B plus student attending American University. And I already started wearing the mask, the strong black woman mask. I was 21 and already I was a strong black woman. And being a strong black woman meant that you handled your business. You did what you had to do no matter what. My mother was dying, but I had to continue to be a successful student. Being a strong black woman meant that you didn't bother others unnecessarily with your pain. In the small apartment where I lived with my mother, my nights were sleepless, tear-filled meltdowns in which in the dark I whispered, shouted, and screamed. The questions I was terrified to ask in the light of day. Why would I soon be a motherless child? How would I go on? And when I was, I remember not telling anybody at the university at all, my teachers, nobody, that my mother was ill because that would have cracked the veneer of strength. I'd rarely if ever seen my mother cry. Maybe she too cried in the dark. How I wish she cried in the light, despite all that she'd made of her life after her arrival in Washington, D.C. as part of the great migration of African-Americans from the South. There was a lot she could have cried about. As I was figuring out how I was gonna write this book, because I'm not a therapist, I'm not a doctor, but I'm a black woman and I'm a storyteller. And many of the stories, all the stories that I've written are deeply connected to the power of stories to heal people. And so one of the things I wanted to do in the book is I wanted to make sure we had a place for the voices of women who would de-stigmatize and detoxify and remove the taboo that's associated with seeking mental health, with going into therapy. And I had some beautiful, very tender, very powerful, wonderful conversations with black women who were very honest about their journeys. And I'm gonna read a little section from one of those conversations. And you will recognize this woman because this is a woman who's in your family. Um, this is a woman who may be you. And I just appreciate so much that she was so open and honest. Part of, I'm, I'm sort of going into the middle of her story. Um, she says, I kept moving up in my career in public relations, communication, and journalism. The higher up I moved, the more needy my family became. My sister and I are the only ones who went to college, the only ones with stable careers. And since my sister could and would say no, everyone came to me. A couple of years later, I was building a solid, satisfying relationship with a new man, building a life. I didn't want family living with me anymore, taking for granted that I would be the family ATM minister or therapist. I had my second child, a son, and more and more I began to feel depleted. One day when my sister who was a homeless street musician showed up at our apartment asking if she and her boyfriend could take a shower, my boyfriend got really protective of me and of our space. We had a terrible argument, my sister and me. My mother called and she took my sister's side. I finally found the courage to say, I simply do not want anyone living with me anymore. We didn't speak for months. Then I finally found the courage to go into therapy. The burden was just too much for me. The therapist helped me understand so much about myself. My philosophy was that, if I, that, that I'm only okay if my family is okay. And since my family was always in crisis, I was never okay. I was always on call for any emergency. She asked me why I felt it was my responsibility to make my family members happy. She told me I could love them, but I didn't have to literally carry my family on my back. And she told me that the word no could be a complete sentence. And I didn't have to explain why I said it. I'm still learning to own my yeses and nos. I realized I was a control freak, like a typical strong black woman I felt if I don't fix it, it won't get fixed. Now I give my family time and space to figure out their own answers and solutions. My therapist walked me through what triggered the breakdown so I could take action to defeat anxiety, the kind that made me crash and burn. 
I'm in a good place now for the first time in my life saying unequivocally yes to myself. And those conversations were so important to me. They're the kinds of conversations that we need to have. We need to have them out loud. We need to bring them out of the closet. And several women shared with me the fact that when they shared with other women that they had been in therapy, that had been enormously helpful, these women thanked them for talking about that and shared that they had wanted to seek mental health care, but didn't know anybody who had. And now that they did, they felt more comfortable doing it. So this is a book that is kind of like a quilt or a mosaic. Um, it goes from discussion of these topics to R. Kelly, to uh, ending with an examination of the book, my favorite book, Their Eyes Are Watching God, and how I feel that the heroine, Janie Crawford, is what I call a new, new age, strong black woman. So Janice, I think we can talk now. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, I'm sure the audience is like me. I could have listened to you for a few more minutes or 20 more minutes. Uh, I love your book. I've read it and I'm sure I'll read it again. Uh, I have a few questions that I'm gonna ask you before we let the audience ask questions. And my first question, Marita, is what was the biggest surprise that you discovered in your research? I think the biggest surprise came when I was doing research and I found a really good anthology about uh, Black women and mental health strength and vulnerability. And one of the editors of the anthology was, was a therapist down in Atlanta named Dr. Kanika Bell. And she writes in the book about a study she did of black women therapists, uh, therapists, counselors, psychologists, and psychiatrists, and their black female clients. And the topic was joy, happiness, peace of mind. And she said that when they were asked to fill out a survey about their feelings about that, so many women on the survey said that they did not have time for joy. They did not have time for peace of mind. That that was something for white women. That as black women trying to live in America, trying to protect their families, they had no concept that they deserved joy. And that was like so surprising and so disheartening. And that finding was replicated in conversations I had with other people who work with African-American women at, who shared, you know, black women are so busy, so busy, busy, busy. We're always working for someone else. And we never, hardly ever take time to do anything for ourselves. Uh, Dr. Arby Chapman has said, the black woman is the most neglected woman in America. She's neglected by a family who never says, what can I do for you? Or asks what she needs. And she even neglects herself because she doesn't believe that she has the right to do anything for herself. Great, wonderful. What is your biggest concern based on all the research that you did coming out of that? What real deep concern do you have about the black woman? Well, I think it's our health. It's, it's our health. As I said, you know, one of the things when I was writing the book, I was coming across all these statistics about the reality of black women's health. The fact that we are the fastest growing segment developing dementia and Alzheimer's. And I didn't want the book to be a book that only was these horrible statistics. So I wanted to include inspiring stories. But at the same time in the book, as you know, I talk very honestly about what we're facing and how just some, some little things that we can do would have an enormous impact on our overall health. I mean, I can't tell you the number of women I talk to, Black women, who have great healthcare plans and don't go to the doctor until, unless they're really, really sick. 
Don't go for physicals. Don't go for annuals. Um, and a lot of it is just a mindset that we're so busy doing for other people. If there'd be two things, I asked um, one therapist, what is the one thing she would, she would tell black women to do? And she said, slow down. And by slow down, she meant slow down. Take some time during the day, five minutes, 10 minutes. That's just for you. Lock the bathroom door. Go out and, and sit in your car. Just have some time for you. And the, one of the um, cardiologists that I talked to in the book, she said she would tell black women to move. And what she means by move is exercise. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're all the time moving. I mean, we, we never stop moving. But I'm talking about intentional movement of the body that is designed to promote health. Walking, um, yoga, Pilates. Go on to YouTube and see what's happening in terms of exercise. Half an hour, 20 minutes. She said, that is so important that that is doing that regularly builds up a strong body. So move and slow down. <laughs> great, great, great advice. And now I don't know whether you've already answered this question, but let me ask, what does changing the strong black woman ideology look like and how can we be a part of that process? Well, I'll, I'll tell a story. Um, I was driving my husband's niece and her sister to see a Walt Disney movie a couple months ago. And they had lost their stepfather, he had died. And I said to them, I know this is a hard time for you. I know you're feeling very sad. I know you've probably cried a lot. And the 10 year old said to me, she said, Aunt Marita, I haven't cried. I'm holding it in. Now she's 10 years old and already She's holding in her emotions. She's a little strong black woman. So I know that now when I'm around her, I have to talk to her about that. I have to talk to her about how I cry, that sometimes I feel sad and there's nothing wrong with feeling sad. And I think those of us who are already practicing these, uh, these habits of mental and physical self-care, we owe it to our other sisters to reach out to them and talk about what we are doing. We don't have to say, you need to lose 50 pounds. We can start the conversation around health and well being. And we may have to start the conversation over and over again, but we owe it to them to engage them in that kind of conversation. And then, Black women have to just start figuring out how to love themselves. You know, we've really got to, and, and Black families, oh gosh, Black families have really got to step up and start asking mothers, what can we do for you instead of giving them another assignment? Great, great. Um, Marita, did you learn anything about yourself that you didn't know in the process of writing this book? Yeah, that I'm not invincible. <laughs> that I was a po I, I had this image, I'm the poster child for black health because I'm doing everything right. But no, you know, there, my journey isn't finished. That is it. For example, I started um, hiking as well as walking. Um, and my doctor modified my uh, regimen of medications once he found out I'd had, you know, the two silent strokes. But I've, I've learned that I did a lot of good things to, to ensure my health, but there's a lot more that even I can do. And that, that this health thing is a, is a never ending journey. Wonderful, wonderful. So you talked a little bit about talking to our sisters or our family members. Is there anything else that you can share with us about how we may start those conversations with, with our families or with young women in our families? Um, I think it's, well, I think you start the conversation by doing something that you probably rarely do. And then sit down with your family and say, you know, this is too much, you know? 
um, I'm feeling overwhelmed and I need your help. One, admit that you're overwhelmed and two, ask for help. And see, we sort of, we're, we're deeply invested in the idea of doing everything because it makes us feel very powerful. It makes us feel very powerful. We've got the answer for everybody. But at the same time, it disempowers people. That is our children figure out, that, oh, mom's gonna do it. I don't have to figure it out. And that weakens them rather than strengthens them. So we have to start being honest with our family members and ask them for help. For example, I'll give you an example. When my husband was um, diagnosed with cancer, this was 25 years ago, um, and he's, he's fine now. Uh, his family members, bless them, would call up every day. How is Joe? How is Joe doing? Not even hello. How is Joe? Now I'm the primary caretaker, um, taking him to the doctor, monitoring his care. So I began to feel deeply offended, deeply hurt that nobody ever asked about me. And so I had a conversation with my mother-in-law and I told her that I felt very hurt and very abandoned that I had to carry so much of Joe's care and nobody in the family seemed to understand that, recognize or give me my props for doing that. Don't you know, from that point on, they asked about me, how are you, Marita? <laughs> they, they brought food over. But if I had not shared with them my pain, they, they would not have. And a lot of times, remember now, we've trained our family members to, to rely on us. We trained them to give us all this stuff. We've trained them that we will do everything. So now we have to let them know that, that, that there's a new, new program. Great, great. I'm taking notes. Is there a tradition, Marita, in your research that you found of self-care among Black women historically, even though we do overdo and overwhelm ourselves, but have we historically had some kind of tradition of self-care? I think that Black women have had, have had many traditions that actually were not seen as self-care, but that are self-care. For example, uh, when our mothers gardened, that's mental self-care. When they gathered in a group to make a quilt, that's emotional self-care. Prayer is, is a profound form of self-care. And um, the church, even though the church has a mixed uh, reputation, on the one hand, it has silenced and marginalized Black women, Black women have found solace and community there. So we have these traditions in our community where Black, but what has happened is we've had these traditions, but we've nonetheless neglected our bodies and we've had those traditions even as we still carry the weight of the community and the weight of our families are on our shoulders. Those are great though. Um, and you mentioned the black church. So the black church is an institution that a many, many of us, many black women see as a place of solace and, and healing. Uh, tell us the other side of that story. Well, the other <laughs> side is that as, as, you know, as we know that in many of the faith traditions that black people are traditionally enrolled in, black women are not allowed in the pulpit. Uh, we also know that when leadership, male leadership in many black churches uh, engage in sexual transgressions, that their victims are hounded out of the church while the leadership person, the, the male leader is um, forgiven. So, and we also know the long tradition of homophobia uh, in the black church, but what you're finding is that many, many younger people are changing, working to change a lot of that. So I think that the church has been very important in our community, but we're also looking, we're, we're bold enough and brave enough 
and compassionate to look at that institution and say, how can we make it even better? Amen. Um, you write in your book about the healing power of stories and reference the stories that your mother and father told you and the stories that you've written and read as a source of healing. So could you talk a little bit about the healing power of stories and storytelling? Yeah, well, stories, whether they are oral or written, are one of the most ancient forms of education and healing. Um, in my family, my mother told me uh, when I was 13 or 12 or something that I was going to write a book one day. Now, that's a, that's a powerful story. That's a, that's a prediction. And it's a story. It's almost like that's the first sentence in a story. And then I, she trusted me to write the rest of that story. And my father was always telling these stories. Bed, my bedtime stories were about uh, uh, Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth. And so I learned very early on that, you know, a really great story has somebody at the center of it who does something powerful and transformative. And what my father was telling me unconsciously was that I could be that kind of person too. And then in my own writing, I think that every story to some extent is, is, a, is, a, is a story about people's emotions. Every story, every story is a metal workup of the characters involved. And I've tried to invest my stories with um, the, the power of healing individually and in community. And the reason I chose to write, to end the book with a with an essay about their eyes are watching God is because that's such a powerful love story. And it's not just a love story about tea cake and Janie, but it's a self love story. Mm -hmm. It's a story of how a woman grows from um, dependence into agency, how she grows into the ability to really celebrate herself and love herself and love her life and um, feel that all good things should come to her. And I think that that's kind of what I was talking about in the book. Great, wonderful. Well, I know that you do a great, great job of that in your stories and your novels and in other books. Um, and speaking with so many different health specialists and health advocates for your book, what was some of the most important advice for Black women that was given to you? Well, yeah, as I said, you know, exercising um, and really, really taking time for yourself. I call it, um, I'm working on a, a companion workbook for this to, to sort of go along with this book because so many women in their response to the book wanted to know more about the nuts and bolts, the practices that have sustained me and that could improve their lives. So I'm, I'm working on a workbook, but just getting, saying hello to yourself. And that's why I think so many of the therapists that I talked to talked about the importance of setting boundaries. That when you say no to someone, that's saying yes to yourself. A lot of times when we're afraid to say no, it's because if we say no and we make time for ourselves, we're afraid to be by ourselves because we're afraid of demons, unhealed trauma that will fill that space. And so if that's a situation, we need to dig deeper and start healing that unhealed trauma. But if, if there's one thing I would tell black women based on my conversations with, with so many people is take time for yourself to exercise your body and to just be with yourself. My relationship with my inner Marita is the most important relationship I have. And she's very smart and I listen to her. Wonderful, wonderful. I, I am going to end this part of the conversation by asking you to give me your thoughts on a woman who is my Shiro and a woman that we honor through our nonprofit, the Celebrate Maya Project, and that is Maya Angelo, who to me, of course, is the epitome of a strong woman um, who knew herself, 
who loved herself and she believed that she was worthy. And what do you think, what, what level of strong black woman would you say that she was? And it's, is who she was something that we should all be emulating in some way? Well, I think she was the, as you say, she's the epitome of the new strong black woman. Um, when she was, you know, raped as a child and chose not to speak to anyone except her brother for about five years, she was doing some serious healing, some serious internal work that, that really healed her in a very important way. And I think that when we read her books, you know, because I've read pretty much everyone she wrote about her life, what we witness is just this, this hunger for life, you know, this hunger for experience, this confidence, this ability to dive in joyfully into her own desires. And that is, and I think that's why she was beloved by so many people. Also, she was a woman who gave herself away. I mean, she was enormously generous. And the last thing she did, one of the last things she did before she died was she came to Washington, D.C. and appeared, she was silly, and, and appeared before a group of students at the Maya Angelou Charter School. And there was a young man who um, wanted to get into the event. And somehow he, he was not able to. And um, after it was over, she, she met him and she said, well, you know, you, you, you stay in touch with me. And the next time I'm here, I'm gonna make sure you, you, you can get in. And she died like three or four days later. And it just was so touching to me that she was giving herself away up until the end. But as she gave herself away, of course, she was receiving so much, so much love. So she was, of course, yeah, the epitome of strong black woman, the new strong black woman. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so very much. This has been just invigorating and I wish we could go on and on, but I think it's time now that we allow the audience to ask questions and I see some are in the chat and I'm gonna go to those first. And the rest of you, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And Ana, you can tell me if there's another way that we could get questions from everyone. But the first question, uh, and I think it's from Janetta, how do we heal the dichotomy of saying no when the pain, when the pain is to say yes, the pain to say yes is powerful, working both sides and trying to please? Well, I think sometimes, first, I think it's important to say that, that on this journey that we're on, there may be times when we simply need professional help. I had sought professional mental health care at two or three different pivotal points in my life. And it made a huge, huge difference. Um, it helped me grieve the loss of my parents. Um, and it prepared me emotionally to bring into my life a a whole healthy man because I was a whole healthy woman. Mm. So I, the first thing I want to say is that sometimes we need to acknowledge that we really do need mental health guidance. Um, and so that's, that's, that's one thing. And I think also another thing is important is that in our lives, we have a lot of people, women, who are often examples of what we want to be and who we want to be. And I think it's really important to use them and to say to them, you know, I noticed that you, you can set boundaries. You don't seem to have a problem saying no. How did you become a person who can say no and live to tell about it? <laughs> so I think that sometimes we do need professional care, health care, to guide us in this journey. Often there are models around us that we can ask for 
the kind of guidance we need. And the other things I'm gonna tell you, I was, whenever I was, um, whenever I'm in crisis, I go to the bookstore. I'll go to the bookstore in a minute because believe me, no matter what you're facing, there is a book out there that somebody has written that will help you go through it. Amen. <laughs> so true. Uh, I want to thank Donna Gray who uh, put in a link for us. She says, join the Black Women's Study Health Group at Boston University. There's a link in there. You guys, you can copy it. Uh, www.bu.edu slash BWHS. And also there's an enormous amount of information on the internet re relevant to black women and mental health. I mean, just so much. Uh, one of the places I always talk about, I interviewed her in the book is Therapy for Black Girls, Dr. Joy Harden Braden down in Atlanta. And her website is a great community for black women who um, are looking for therapists. She has a list of black therapists all over the country. You put your zip code in, you'll find somebody. Um, she has podcasts. She has group meetings, and she's doing some really, really good things in terms of guiding Black women on this journey, which is a lifelong journey of mental health. Absolutely. I have another question from Valencia. Do you think that African-American women can get the best therapy with non-Black therapists? Um, I have had both Black and white therapists. And when I was with working with a white therapist, I did not have a problem. Um, and today, I would think that many white therapists would be extremely sensitive. That, that is any area where they felt they could not help you because of a, a cultural issue, they would say that. But I do understand why some people may feel that they want to only work with a black therapist. But I think the issue around therapists is that it takes time to find the right therapist. Sometimes people will say, well, I went to this therapist and, and in the book, the, the women that I interviewed, several of them say that it took me several, several therapists to find the right therapist. And you can have a black therapist who will be completely incompatible. I mean, I had one of the women in the book said that um, a black woman told her that all she needed to do was go to church. Mm. One, an, another black therapist said, oh, I, we can handle this in one visit. So that just because a therapist is black does not mean that you're gonna have an automatic deep connection. But I think if you do want to have a black girl, that's fine. But just understand that it may take you some time and you have the right to stay in it until you find the right therapist. You should not say, I tried this therapy, she didn't work, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna go and I'm not gonna stay in the process. Another problem that, um, that's even a bigger problem is once you get into therapy, many therapists shared with me that women will be in therapy and get to a point in the therapy where the real crux of the matter is being discussed. And they are so terrified of crossing that river and allowing themselves to feel the pain, to relive the trauma in order to heal, that they never go back. Mm -hmm. So it's a complicated issue finding a good therapist, but it, is, it can be extremely, extremely helpful and important to do. Thank you. We have a question from Dr. Cherise Branch-Jones. Uh, first of all, she says, thank you for your wisdom, Dr. Golden. Thank How do we welcome. push past the guilty that often comes with engaging in self-care? Yeah, and I think that that's, that's something that you do a little bit, a little bit at a time. First, you make the decision that you're going to celebrate yourself, that you're going to take care of yourself, that you're going to say no when you feel like it, and you're gonna say yes to yourself. And then you don't try to have a transformation in one weekend or one week or in one month. You simply do one small thing 
as often as you can that is symbolic. Like the first time you tell your mother or your husband that you can't do that thing that you've always been doing, they're going to push back. Expect it. But, you, but the problem isn't with them pushing back. The problem is with you buckling. You have to have enough love of yourself to say, but you know, I really can't do it. If you have to say no 800 different ways, keep saying no. That's the real issue. So you're not trying to transform and become this, this person who's A plus in all these ways overnight. One small thing as often as you can. One small thing. And those small things will build up. Maybe you don't exercise for 20 minutes the first time you start an ex exercise regimen. Maybe you just do 10 minutes. Maybe you have to practice in the mirror, saying no to someone you're afraid that do that. But it's one small thing as often as you can. And you will be amazed at the impact over time, I think, that that can have. Wonderful. Um, a comment from Dolores Malone. I totally, totally agree when it comes to therapists, you do have to try to find the right therapist who will work with you. Many non-Black therapists are aware of the issues surrounding Black people today. So thank you for that comment. Um, that is all the comments in the chat. Anna, is there a way to to get questions from the audience. Everybody has to unmute themselves and speak. Okay. <laughs> okay, if there is anyone else who has a question or would like to respond to the first question we asked you to think about, if there is a strong black woman who impacted your life, if you'd like to share that with us, please do so. We've got about five minutes left, maybe three minutes. My mother. Please introduce yourself. I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to help my husband do some work around the house. I'm Sharice Jones Branch. Um, I'm a huge fan of, a fan of your work. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. Um, for us and coming in and, and talking to us because I know that that's, this has been a struggle for me. And I spent a lot of time thinking very deeply about what it means to be a strong black woman. And I've ultimately decided for myself that I get to define that on my terms. And on some days being a strong black woman means I'm taking a wellness day, not responding to emails or doing anything for anybody. Um, but the strongest, Black woman I know is my mother. Mm -hmm. I mean, just hands down, it's, it's, it's my mother. What I've seen her endure and what I've seen her survive, um, I wouldn't. I, I just don't think I would. And so I just, I just watch her and, you know, always try to do the very best I can to um, make her proud because, because I know the kind of sacrifice that she made for me and my siblings. I know that she was a powerful example for you, but she still is. She still, old, is. She still is. How old is she? 75. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, are there things that when you watched her being strong, knowing what you know now, that you wish she could have done or had? I honestly wish she had more emotional support um, within the relationship. She, she's still in with my father and I'm just being very candid about, mm -hmm. about that because um, part of what I took away from watching her was what not to do as much as what to do. And exactly. so I, I do wish she had had more support. I, I wish she had, I wish she had questioned the way she was raised and the generation that she came from 
to understand that there are certain things that you, you just don't have to tolerate and, and you don't always have to put other people for you to your own detriment. Mm -hmm. um, and so those are, those are some of my takeaways now, but I would tell anybody that I tell my mom all the time that she's, she's my shero and I, I just know that I can't, I could not do just a fraction, even a fraction of what she's done for my siblings and I. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Thank you. And thank you for reading my books. <laughs> oh, yes, I, I'm, I'm ordering it for some other people. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dr. Cherise. Anyone else? I, I have a... Janetta? Uh, uh, my my um, role model as a strong Black woman is my mom. And the uh, my question came from my mom's... Um, personality and my life during her lifetime is how she said yes much of the time when I was of the opinion she might have wanted to say no. So the dichotomy between saying yes when your heart wants to say no is a part of uh, maybe it's her generation but I think it still exists. How do we um, meander set boundaries between that when some of the time we'd like to say no we just don't have the resources to be able to do that we are a large family she was the the glue in our family and the strength even though she wasn't the physical strength she was the strength of our family and she was the strongest person i've ever known at five foot one so the question is she said yes lots of time to all of us, including our dad. And for our own, her health and for her longevity, no would have been a better answer. So I'm trying to understand how one meanders between yes and no healthfully, uh, whether they have mental health care or not. Well, I think also we have to remember that our mothers lived in a world before women's liberation, feminism, and women, women's rights, so that our mother's generation, but my mother left three husbands, <laughs> and there were women in our mother's generations who didn't put up with, with a lot of stuff. So I don't wanna act like um, it took all of that, but I think that, um, what, you, what you're asking is how do we navigate? As I said earlier, we navigate very carefully. We navigate with confidence. We navigate with the understanding that we have the right to say no. We negotiate no. Some people you negotiate no with. You don't just say no. Um, but the main thing is to say yes to yourself boldly and firmly. And once you say yes to yourself boldly and firmly, it's easier to say no to others and to figure out that no is not always closing a door. You can say, well, I can't help you. I can't do that for you, but you know what? I can show you where you will find that information on the internet. Um, I can't do that today. Um, maybe, let me look at my calendar. Maybe I can do it next week. Um, I've done that a bunch of times. I really think it's time to ask somebody else, but without the courage and the self-love to stand up for the yes, you cannot say no. This has been such a wonderful conversation. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, there's two wonderful uh, comments in the chat, but I'm not sure we have time. It's past eight already. Uh, okay. And, okay. Let me read uh, the two comments. One is, thanks, Marita, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with such generosity, sensitivity, and grace. There's a question. What difference do you see in the way in which the different generations of Black women view the idea of the strong Black woman? And secondly, what conversations have you had with Black men about their thoughts and feelings on the strong Black wo woman complex? as well as the new strong black woman. And I think we have to quickly answer these questions. Yeah, well, I think that um, younger black women are more open to therapy. 
more open to self-examination and more open to saying no. Um, in my own family, there are a number of young, you know, women in our family member, in our family who are in therapy, whose children are, they've taken them to therapy. So I think that the younger generation is really much more open to, to that idea. And we, the older generation, we have a lot to learn from them. Um, and the other question was, the second one, one was if you oh with black that. men yeah well I've had many black men have, have said to me that they wanted to buy the book for their wives that they wanted to read the book for themselves so they could learn to understand and love black women better and that their mental health issues are, that are similar for, for, for black men so I found black men very receptive and this is a book that's for black women it's a book for black men. It's for anybody that loves black women. It's for white people who want to be our allies and understand our experience. So this is really a book for anybody. And I've been really pleased that so many people are buying multiple copies. The week before Christmas, a friend came over with 12 copies that she had me autograph, <laughs> giving to everyone in her family. So, but thank you, Janice. Thank you, Garbo. This thank has been great. And thank everybody who's, who joined us tonight. Thank you. Garbo, I'm giving it back to you. Well, once again, it's the epitome of the night is that everybody on this call is a strong black woman because you are here. And Janice, you did an excellent job of moderating and Marita, you know, it goes unsaid. Thank you so much for giving us your time and your energy. And we welcome you to purchase the book. It definitely needs to be on your bookshelf. Uh, on our website, come by the gallery. We will definitely take care of you. And thank you and good night. And thank you. Good night. Thanks, Janice. Thank you, Marita. Thanks, Garbo. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye bye. Thanks, Janice. I think it went really well, don't you?